I'll even hopefully um, today show you a little bit of the data that um, that actually came out of Instruments uh, this morning. Um, and I haven't had a chance to look at it, so it'll be my first opportunity to look at this data as well, which is cool. Okay, um, so I'm uh, up at the Large Lakes Observatory, uh, which is part of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, I'm an associate professor there in the Department of Physics. Um, and just a, a couple quick words. Can we turn off this front oh, yeah. light right here? Is this, yeah. is this right uh, here? No. No? That no. no. one. There you go. <laughs> We have many um, options for yep, very good. lighting. Um, maybe yeah, that keep that one back on. Yeah, that's good. That's perfect. Um, just a really quick word on what this Large Lakes Observatory is. Um, we, it's a group of people who all have interests in studying large the, the fundamental scientific processes in large lakes around the world, not just the U.S. Great Lakes. And we don't spent a huge amount of time thinking about things like restoration and, and remediation and all those sorts of things, management, which are all very important things. The people there are more interested in understanding sort of the fundamental science behind how these lakes work. So I have a, a, a joint appointment in the physics department, but we also have people in chemistry, uh, biology, and geology there. And if there was something that really tied all of us together, a common thread in our research, it would probably be climate. And not just climate over the last hundred years, not global warming and all that sort of stuff, but looking at using lakes as tape recorders, uh, as recorders of climate in the past. So we spent a lot of time digging up sediment cores from the bottoms, bottoms of lakes around the world um, and using those to determine, for instance, the, uh, the climate of East Africa over the last half million years, one of the big projects that's been done there. So a lot of really interesting work. It's a fun, fun place to work. Um, I'd like to start, um, today I'm going to talk about um, some work that I've done recently in uh, the last couple of years on looking at climate change over the last several decades in Lake Superior. Um, this, is a, this is a piece of climate change art. Uh, I didn't know such a thing existed until I got into the whole climate change business. And it illustrates a couple things, or I put this in here for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's about the most colorful slide um, you'll see today. But also, it, um, it shows that the rate of change of air temperature in the region and the rate of change of water temperature in the region are different. And that water temperature change is a lot quicker. And when we first saw this, we were very confused. You would think that a lake being a big, you know, very slowly changing thing. Look, think about how long it takes to heat up water on the stove for spaghetti. You, know, you have to put a lot of heat into water to get it to change the temperature. But somehow, Lake Superior is even more sensitive to this change than, than, than we expected. Um, and the other thing I think this illustrates is that there's a great deal of popular interest in this topic. People are very interested in climate. And, and lakes, people have a very strong connection, you know, up here at Lake Superior, but, you know, across Minnesota, it, we have a very, very, um, it's, it's a big part of our culture, is these lakes. Like, so we're very interested in what was causing this change. Um, here's Lake Superior. This morning, I was just off the shore a little bit up here. We're down here in Duluth, obviously. Um, and this is my study region. We have moorings all over the lake, up into the northern portions and down in the deep southern basins. Um, but I'm going to start today um, with observations at uh, Sault Ste. Marie. And there's a, there's a power plant there. Looks like this. And water flows through this power plant to generate electricity, mostly to run the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, um, to get boats up into Lake Superior from here in Michigan. Um, and it turns out that somebody has been measuring temperature once a day at the intake of this plant since 1906. It's a tremendous asset, or a tremendous resource, I'm sorry, um, in that these sorts of long, consistent data sets are really very unusual. So um, when we heard about this, a lot of the data had already been um, collated by NOAA, but we got the last 15 years and put that together as well. Um, and what we found, this, this is the raw data. It doesn't really look like anything. All you see is it getting warm and cold, warm and cold every year for 100, 101 years. Um, and if you squint your eyes, maybe you can convince yourself that these maxima are going up over time. But what we did is we took the data from July, August, and September. We defined that as our summer season. And we said, how is that changing over time? And we subtracted out the long-term mean. So if this, this temperature anomaly is lower than zero, it means that was a, a slightly cooler year, and it's greater than zero. It's slightly warmer. You can see that. Um, it was low over here, and then sort of average here, and then really since about 1980, it's really taken off. And we have a couple more data points now since then, um, or since we did this. But 
you get the idea that um, things really have changed, um, and that change has really increased in its intensity since about 1980. Um, uh, the, the red curve here is a decadal or 10-year average. And I think the thing that the message to take away here is that the change over this time is on the order of two and a half or three degrees Celsius. You sort of have to double that in your head if you want to get there. Okay? So we're talking about a significant change at this one location on the order of five, even six degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty remarkable. Um, this is the global air temperature average. Um, so there's a group called the Goddard Institute of Space Science, and they collect air temperature data from thousands and thousands of stations around the globe. Air temperature, not water temperature. And they average those together. Um, and that's, if you're reading a Newsweek article on global warming, this is probably the curve that you see. And again, you see this pattern where it sort of warms gently up to about 1940 and plateaus and really takes off after about 1980. Well, the thing that really bothered us when we saw, when we saw that, when we saw this data here, we we're like, well, you see the same pattern, but look at the magnitude of this change. It's on the order of a degree Celsius um, instead of three degrees Celsius. So we realized at this stage that the lake was actually changing a lot more quickly than the global average. And we thought, well, maybe, you know, there are regional variations in global warming and stuff like that. So we took air temperature. This, so this compares the, um, that global mean in green to Lake Superior uh, from that one station. And again, the thing we're emphasizing here is the size of the signal is much larger. And there's, there's still a huge amount of variability from year to year. Nobody denies that. Okay, so, but behind all of that strong variability, there's this, this really significant trend towards warmer temperatures. Um, and it's on the order, over the last 25 or 30 years, on the order of about a tenth of a degree C per year. Um, when we compared that to regional air temperatures, thinking that maybe it was just that Lake Superior was sitting in a region of particular warming, um, we found that those regional air temperatures um, were about um, six one hundred. It's about half of what we observe in the water. So there's still something going on that's causing the water to behave differently than the air around it. And we were very curious about that. Um, so we decided to turn to some more recent data. Someone could, could legitimately complain that this data we're using is not really in the middle of Lake Superior. It's, it's on the other side of Whitefish Bay, and it's in the middle of the St. Mary's River, and is it really representative of the open lake or not? And we wrote another paper on that uh, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago that showed that yes, you can use it as a proxy for open lake temperatures, but let's not worry about that. Right now. <laughs> let's think about these. There are three of them in Lake Superior. Um, they're um, run by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they have a group called the National Data Buoy Center. They have hundreds of these buoys around the coast of the United States and up in the Great Lakes as well. These are nice because, first of all, they're out in the middle of the lake. I think I have a map here. Yeah, so there's three of them, western, central, and eastern. Um, so they're not, they're not, they're in very deep water. They're not in the middle of a river or something like that. Um, they've been in there since about 1980. Um, so we've got 30 years now, which is actually quite a bit. So it's a it's long enough uh, time series that we can start to see trends. Um, they're only in from April through November, or really May through November these days, um, because they can't be in during the ice over season. Um, and they measure not just water temperature, but air temperature and wind speed and wind direction. You see some anemometers up on top here. So we can get a lot more data than just water <coughs> temperature. It's very, very useful. And it's free. You could go online this afternoon and download all the data collected by the NEBC for the last 30 years if you want to. I wouldn't suggest it, but the data is there. Um, and it's free to, free to Google. You and I pay for our tax money. Um, and there are buoys in, in the other Great Lakes as well, not just Lake Superior, which is handy, um, because we can start to look at more than just one lake. Lake Ontario only got a buoy in 2002. I'm not sure why it took so long to get one for Lake Ontario. So here are the three buoys. And I'm going to show data, I think, just for the central one, to give you an idea of what's going on at that. And, and this is representative, you have to take my word, that the trends we see at these other two sites are very similar to what we see at that site. And so here's what happened when I did the same thing to that data. I took the July through September data, and I averaged those together. I guess I didn't subtract the anomaly out here. But, and again, there's a huge amount of variability. 1998 was a very strong El Nino year, the very warmest year up until this last year, it turns out. And we see a trend, if you fit that, that's statistically significant, that's on the same order of what we saw at Sault Ste. Marie, a little over a tenth of a degree C. And if you took the maximum temperatures instead of the, mid instead of the average, you see almost exactly the same trend. It doesn't really matter how you slice it or dice it, there's still this, 
this remarkable trend towards warmer temperatures in the sun. Um, okay, so here's the, the quick science lesson. I think I have time. Oh. Um, good, okay. Um, and I don't know how much of this stuff people have already covered. Have you talked? Have, have you guys been doing classes or something like that? Or is this just a series of little workshops like this? A series of little workshops like, like this. Okay, so great. You're introducing something new here. Okay, great. So I will, I'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, we're all familiar with the concept of density. It's the ratio of, um, of the mass of a certain object to its volume, okay? And density tends to be an intrinsic property of material. So if I talked about the air in this room, if you told me it's temperature and you told me the pressure in here, I could tell you it's density, right? Or for water. Um, water weighs, if I have a cubic meter of water, which is from this corner to about here, so a box, a meter on the side, it would weigh about 1,000 kilograms. If you have a liter of water, um, which is um, like a, roughly a quart, it weighs about a kilogram. It turns out that, that um, the idea that um, the density of something depends on temperature is also something we're relatively familiar with. You go into your house on a hot summer day, and upstairs is broiling, and down in the basement is nice and cool. It's because that hot air is rising to the top of the cool air. Because it's heavier, it sinks to the bottom of the room. Or if you're up at your, your uncle's cabin, and you go dive in the, the lake out behind the cabin, and it's nice and warm at the surface, and you dive down a couple meters, and it gets real cold down there. People may be familiar with this. Uh, light things want to sit on top of heavy things, OK? Um, and for water, that's fine. Um, this is a chart. This is a plot of density on this axis as a function of temperature. And the really odd thing about this is it doesn't just get more and more dense as it gets colder. It gets more and more dense until it reaches about 4 degrees Celsius. And then it gets less dense. This little blip here, this little blip, um, is fundamentally important for understanding the ecology of freshwater systems in general, especially in mid-latitudes where it can get cold. You know, in a tropical system, this doesn't make any difference because you're always over here. But in, in, in mid-latitudes and high latitudes, this is extraordinarily important because it means that in the summer, yeah, I have these two slides now, in the summer, this is what, if we went out to the middle of Lake Superior in August and we took a probe and we loaded it through the water column, we would see warm water at the surface, maybe the top 10, 20 meters, and we'd see cooler water below because that warm water is, is less dense and it wants to sit on top. On the other hand, if we went out there in the winter, and this is sort of the amazing thing, this is what we'd see. We'd see colder water overlying warmer water. And this, this layer might be very, very deep. The reason it's deep is because in the winter, you have these big energetic storms coming through and churning up the water and mixing it down, mixing that surface water down. And so you get a relatively uh, thick layer of, of cold water sitting on top of the denser four degree water um, down below. Okay. Well, it turns out that this is very useful. Uh, there's, a, there's a subject called phenology, which is the study of seasonality, okay? And it's like finding the first robin of spring or seeing lilacs bloom or something like that. It's a very, very distinct indicator of, of the change of the season. Lakes have sort of the same thing in that if I have a temperature measurement at the surface of the lake, if I, if I put a temperature sensor up here and I see it pass through four degrees Celsius, I know that the whole water column has to be four degrees Celsius. And the lake is either going to start stratifying positively or start stratifying negatively. It's a great indicator of season. And so what we could do is go back through those historical records, um, the NOAA and BBC ones that I mentioned earlier, and we can look for the date at which that four degree mark gets reached in the spring. And this is a plot of that. These are years down here from 1979 through 2010. Um, we haven't reached overturn for 2011 yet, way too early in the season. And this is the start of that summer stratification, when the lake reaches 4 degrees C at the surface. And the common wisdom is that this occurs in Lake Superior in mid-July. We can see that, that after 1998, which was a very, very early year, early uh, sort of mid-June, it really hasn't been as, as late as that. It's been more sort of at the beginning of July. And then 2010, amazing year. And we had very, very little ice on the lake, and we'll talk about that connection in just a bit. But we had overturn in um, early to mid-June in 2010. So this is an indication that, that that summer season is starting earlier. When that summer season starts earlier, the lake simply has more time to warm in the summer. Um, this is sort of funny. My wife is also a professor at 